Welcome to the Talking Toughness series of podcasts, where we examine the mental toughness concept with guests from a wide range of sectors, illustrating that our mental approach to what happens to us and around us matters for all of us. Our guests come from the worlds of business and public service, education, social mobility, sport and health. They all share their experiences and their observations about the factors that have enabled them to survive and to thrive on their journey through life. Many guests have gone further and incorporated the concept into what they do as coaches, trainers, managers and leaders, helping others to thrive in their turn. Their experiences are valuable to those of us who strive to do the same. Well, good morning, everyone. Our guest this morning is Neil Scales. And Neil is somebody who I've known, I've just suddenly realised I've known for uh, around 20 years. Neil is currently the Director General for Queensland's Department of Transport and Main Roads. And that's a really substantial organisation with a budget of around ten and a half billion pounds and looking after assets uh, approaching 100 billion pounds. Neil is responsible for the transport infrastructure for an area that is larger than many countries and he's been doing this for nearly 11 years but before that he was chief executive and director general for Mersey Travel in the UK and he held that post for about 15 years. There he won a reputation for delivering some challenging performance goals and for innovation and that was eventually recognised through the award of his OBE, the Order of British Empire. An engineer by background, in his early part of his career he was involved in bus manufacture, maintenance and purchasing. Neil is an early adopter of the mental toughness concept, his coach at one time being Professor Peter Clough, the developer of the original Four Seas concept that is now recognised the world over. So Welcome, Neil. How are we this morning? Well, we're, we're very good. The sun is shining and we're bright and breathing and still enjoying life. So things are, you know, really, really excellent anyway for me. And young John's now joined us as well, I see. <laughs> so, hiya, John. No, uh, no I think it's been, John, anyway. <laughs> uh, it's been, been a very interesting journey. But so I've been here, as you said, took 10 years now. We've got 9,500 staff and it's... Um, it's for the whole of Queensland, which is 1.725 million square kilometres. So it's, it's a pretty big place. So although 5.2 million people, so not that many people in, in a big space, but 85% of us and 85% of all Australians are within 50 kilometres of the coast. So it's, um, there's a lot of empty area in the middle. But one of the challenges I've got is actually, you know, providing the right services to, to all those people when... You know, in the southeast corner here, based in Brisbane, we've got 5G. Um, parts of Queens, if you look, you'd have 1G or a guy with a fork stick that's running down the road <laughs> with a message in the middle. You know? So so we've really got to make sure we've got equity um, across the state and across Australia. And I know the feds, the federal government are working hard on that. So, no, it's been a, been a very interesting journey. And some of the stuff behind me is... All my engineering toys, some of it is ex Mersey side, as, as you actually did in your intro. So, yeah, it's been, been good. Oh, that's a nice little uh, intro, Neil. Uh, you used a, a, a word a couple of times in there, and that's a word that I would strongly associate with you. And that's the word challenge. You spoke about the challenge of, of you know, providing good transport and connectivity for people in a pretty difficult area. But I've always associated you with the, the term challenge. So if I had to take you back for a minute to Mersey Travel, that was just a wash with challenge. Can you tell us about what it is about you yeah, that and, likes challenge? Well, some of them are, were insurmountable challenges or <laughs> intractable challenges. But I think that, that's what I enjoy. And I think resilience in the face of any difficulty you might face is, is just usually life, isn't it? And... Um, I'm very difficult, as you know, to deflect. And um, I think once you've got the vision, and the vision was really, you know, supporting the people of Merseyside and beyond, but providing a first-class transport network when, you know, they've gone through some pretty difficult times with uh, the recession, then the demise of the port, 
lots of uh, industries sort of packed up and left. And we were, as Mersey Travel, operating the ferries, the tunnels, as well as the transport network. So getting a single integrated network was really, really uh, a challenge then. Um, particularly when you were uh, what we knew, knew known then as a, an objective one area. So Merseyside as a region was 75% or below the EU average, European Union average for any um, for any region of that type. So what, what we got there was a lot of grants in. We had to spend the grants wisely. So a lot of the stuff we built there was infrastructure. So we built six new train stations, four new bus stations, ferry terminals. Uh, ferry, the ferries were, were a different story altogether because um, they actually operate under a charter given by King John in the 1200s. So you can't actually get rid of the ferries unless you have an act of parliament. Of course, you'd never get it through. So one of the things I did was turn it into um, a tourist attraction rather than just a way to get across the river. So uh, we had an aging fleet of trains. So we, we got control of the trains uh, through a lot of hard work and um, turned them into the best performing railway in the UK out of the 25 train operating companies. And on the Mersey tunnels, we put a bill through Parliament, which was the only bill to get, the only private bill, because it wasn't a, a bill sponsored by government. So the only private bill to get through in 25 years, and it was opposed at every stage. So that, you know, showed me the value of, of resilience and also um, just tenacity and just, just keeping going. And I, I think it's all to do with attitude, which is the stuff that Peter Clough was involved in um, in the early days. The whole thing is about, sort of attitude and if you think about um mental toughness a lot of it was centered around athletes in the past i remember talking to lord core seb cause he was then and he had a sports psych but what the hell do you want a sports psych for all you do is like run around the track and try and beat um you know the opposition and he explained it was all about keeping you centered you know keeping you on your game and had all these people telling them what to eat and when to eat it and all the rest of it. And I thought, oh, well, sports psychology is interesting, but effectively it's life, isn't it? And it doesn't really matter whether you're in sport or whether you're in where I am on, on transport or, you know, whether, it, you know, whatever walk of life you've got, you've got to have some sort of resilience. <laughs> and I remember when Cluffy, actually Professor Cluff, uh, started doing this stuff, it was... Um, he wrapped a lot of academic rig around it, and it came out, I think, from memory as basically hardiness, you know, the ability just to keep going. And as a Sunderland supporter of over five decades, you know, the glass is always half full. <laughs> so, so one of the things that was really interesting when I went to Merseyside is that because I supported Sunderland, half my staff were Liverpool, the other half were Evertonians. I could get away with murder because they always took pity on me because um, I was a Sunderland supporter. But when... When Peter Clough came out with four C's model, you know, control, co commitment, challenge, and confidence, confidence. I think. Yeah. yeah. So I really subscribed to that. And he turned it into MTQ40. That then gave you a measure. And then sort of other people joined up. But you, can, you can't teach mental toughness, but you can actually put in, you know, a lot of effort to make sure that by doing certain things, and I'll explain what I think that they are, just, just to keep these traits going and, and to, sort of inculcate them into into the staff and the four c's model i think what peter developed was that you worked out that you know the higher echelon in an organization were more mentally prepared or tougher or hardier than subordinates so you think well why is that and a lot of it is to do, do with the the way the cultures formed and you know <laughs> culture each strategy for breakfast as um you know the academics here and they're right and if you get the culture right and you get the, um, you know, the, the actual environment right and as correct as you can, then I think you can do great things. Now, one of the things that I've always done, I've done for the past four decades now, is I'm always in a Marks and Spencer white short sleeve button down shirt, Marks and Spencer suit. I'm wearing an indigenous tie today, but I've always wear, you know, I always wear bright ties. So the staff say there was a uniform. So, oh, that's Neil, that's Gildy, that's the DG or whatever. And he's, always in the same uniform so and it's deliberate you know and it's it, it's easy to do but it's a uniform but it's repeatability and it also gets a bit of confidence and the other thing i've always done is communicate really well 
and communication is a really interesting part of mental toughness because it's a it's a treadmill. Once you get on it, you kind of get off. Because if you get off the naysayers, I'll say, when he wasn't really interested, you know, and you get off. Um, and basically, we take a bell curve of any organization. It's the same here with 9,500 of us. It was the same in Mersey with 1,000 of us. You'll have 95% of the population think, yeah, you're doing all right. 2.5% think you're a hero, and 2.5% think you're an idiot. But you don't concentrate on the 2.5%, you concentrate on the 97.5% that you're making a difference with. And we through Mersey Learn, which was a, um, it was a fund uh, set up by the trade unions, actually, of, about advancing their members. And, and I think of the 1,000 people in Mersey, probably 998 were members of some sort of union. And we set up something called Mersey Learn, and it was all about getting people in uh, the way of education. So it didn't really matter to me whether people were doing Indian head massage or they were doing, you know, 35 mil photography or they were doing something to do with uh, bus timetables or how to operate a ferry. It was all about getting into the to the way of learning. And a lot of people uh, could probably come out of school at that time with a really bad experience. So getting them back into learning, it had to be non-threatening, supported from the bottom as well as the top. And it was a really interesting experience. But after seven years, um, we ended up with, I can't remember the exact numbers now, but something like 40 plus MBAs. And we kept on winning awards for this, this Mersey Learn thing. And that was part of what I did on, you know, I didn't know it then, but it was like mental toughness because it's like, if you can get continuous learning in and continuous learning is an attitude and a way of life, it's not just episodic, you, you know, you can't just, punt it up and down all the time mm. uh you know you've got to keep it going so and that became the norm and then we had a really big celebration where we put on a lunch which always attracts the people um but we used to do all these awards i'd get on the stage with the chairman mark dad and we we'd hand all these awards out and make an event of it so it was really small in year one but by the time we got to year six or seven it was a massive event with lots of awards and then it got its own momentum going and then what that did is, as part of the resilience side, it, it made the staff much more agile. I don't think agile is well defined in the academic circles because when people say agile, to me, it's about agile manufacturing. So it's about all the work that's been done with uh, the Japanese and also uh, the Scandinavians and the Indians on you know agile manufacturing. It doesn't really necessarily translate across to, to people, but the people did become you know, agile and that they was, were resilient and didn't matter what, you know, was thrown up at them. Um, they actually managed to get through it. Now, there's a concept now about, um, you know, radical uncertainty, and, and that's been well-researched. And there's a good book on it by uh, Mervyn King and John Keir. So Mervyn King is Lord King, used to be the governor of the Bank of England, John Keir, another eminent um, economist. And basically what they're saying is that doesn't matter what, happened in the past you can't use that to fast forward to the future and they use the global financial crisis of 2008 as a, as a mechanism to just you know to describe that and the issue there is that you know we lost a bank um you know people lost the you know the livelihoods and the whole thing went all sort of wobbly in a bit and we're seeing it now on corporate that's a, an area of radical uncertainty and the next one i believe will be um climate change, where you're going to get short, sharp, really bad disruptions, like what happened in England just a few few months ago, where you got that spike in temperature. <laughs> or it's going to be, what well, we get tropical cyclones, minimum of two, maximum five a year, but they're going to be harder and sharper. You're also going to get droughts as well, and you're seeing that in Europe. So that's going to be the next area of radical uncertainty. So what does that mean? It means that for people like on this podcast and people like you two, we're going to have to train people up to be able to cope with that. And it's going to be really hard because if you look at um, the after effects of COVID, I stepped up the communications and I did a couple of mind maps uh, to explain the, the staff what we're going to do. And then when I saw my way through it, how we're going to sort of maintain um, the activities that we had to do. Because um, one of the things was the communication side, which we stepped up because if you don't communicate with everybody, and I did at least two videos a week and one DG message a week and fired it out. Um, we put two weekly um, meetings together with the whole of uh, my stakeholder groups. So that's logistics companies, rail operators, bus operators, train operators, 
uh, suppliers, uh, the civil engineering industry, and bear in mind that 84% of contact with Queenslanders are through this department, mainly because of registration and licensing. And we've got 21 ports and we control all the harbour masters and all the regulation on that. So I used to have this one hour meeting, which we got down to 40 minutes in the end. So I'll tell everybody what I could see, what was coming up, what the issues were. And then I gave them my notes and fired them out. Now, normally that wouldn't happen because as a DG, the thought police won't let you actually do anything unless you've got a script and you're not supposed to go off that script. And of course, I always, as Doug will know, I go off the script a lot because otherwise, if you can't make the thing come to life, what, what's the point? So people got to know that that was going out. So we, we kept everybody on an even keel because for the first time in 100 years, we, we had a hard closure on the borders, which was effective in that we only had seven deaths uh, until we opened up last December. And that's gone up to nearly 2,000 deaths now. But how do you close a border on such a big state, which, is, which actually shares borders with Northern Territory and South Australia? So we just turned it into a giant random breath test where the inside lane you could get sniffed off and you know if you, and we put in automatic number plate camera recognition so we, we know it was dodgy and it wasn't dodgy so you could bring them out and turn them around. And the outside lane, if, if you had all the right passes and originally there were paper, then we morphed into electronic tied into the registration number. Uh, they just went on the outside lane there. So, so it worked like giant RBTs, random breath tests. And um, it worked really well. But everything we did on, on COVID was new. So we didn't, we slowed down um, what I've called steaming, sort of the, the amount of time it takes to get to our ports. So that if you had, you know, a COVID-19 outbreak or something looked like COVID-19, you could put in, uh, hold the vessel offshore, put Queens and Health people in, make sure that the people weren't, you know, had COVID, then all good, then into the port, then out again, and crew changes we did as well. So the stuff we did in our ports was trying to translate the New South Wales, Melbourne, and also to Western Australia to, to Perth. So we did a lot of good work on that. But if we hadn't got the people in, in a comfortable environment where they knew what was happening and they knew where we were trying to go, although you know, I know I'm going to build a bridge and I know where the end point is, but I don't know whether the bridge is a suspension bridge or a, you know, a bridge on pillars or, or whatever, but I'm building this bridge. You know, I don't know where the end point is, but we're building it together and bringing everybody together. So I think on the control, commitment, challenge and confidence side, it's, it's all about essentially mental toughness. And one of the issues that you've got with mental toughness that you, you can't really predict is you provide this environment you make sure it's non-threatening so people can, you know, fail. If they fail, fail fast, learn from it, and then keep going. You give them the opportunity and the permission to do that. But it's bloody difficult to keep it going because, you know, it's a, it's a constant treadmill. So I was fortunate in that I developed the comm skills that I've got now um, with the Open University because I used to be a, a tutor as well as a student. And I went back to the Open University too. Yeah, two years ago to do a micro credential in um, in radical uncertainty. That's why I know a bit about it. But also, uh, three years ago, I did the Vincent Fairfax Fellowship, which is a course in um, in leadership, which is all about ethical leadership. So I'm a Vincent Fairfax fellow now in ethical leadership. But the Fairfax family in the eighties got concerned that there was too much um, sort of unsavoury happenings in senior leadership, and they wanted to, you know. <laughs> train a group of people that would go into Australia basically and you know spread the word it's got to be ethical leadership and we were cohort 24 which means that it'd been going for 25 years so I'm a certain it's, it's all about the leadership and the journey and the journey is this continuous improvement and that's also you know make, making a life you know making it your life to continuously learn um, because nobody learns a job and then that's the end of it. So if you make it interesting, like we did with Mersey Learn at uh, Mersey Travel, like I'm doing here, it, it's pretty good. Now, one of the things that we introduced was working from home. Before COVID, to work from home, you had to donate a kidney, support some of the football club, you know, get it in blood from me. <laughs> but you didn't, but it was really hard to work from home. So what we did here, we put three systems in. System one was you've got to have a, an ergonomic place in your dwelling where you can sit, you know, good light, 
you know, a good seat and all the rest of it. Second system, it's, and it had to be um, uh, subject to workplace health and safety. So, you know, it wasn't dangerous for you to work at home. Second system, so that's the first trip. Second system was that you had to have good communication. So we made sure that the comms side between where you live and back here, although we've got 100 locations across the state, so wherever you were, the, the comms were rock solid. We also bought, bought a lot of uh, laptops. That was the second system. And the third system is um, it's two days a week. You have to get your manager to approve it, and it's renewed every six months. But you have to be committed to a personal development plan, which has continuous learning in. So those three systems together work incredibly well. Now, of the people that could work from home, so 46% of the workforce, that's our workforce, work from home. It's now gotten back to about 18%, but that's 18% of a big number. And the wrap round that I did, which is the resilience bit, was domestic violence triggers. So just make sure that if you're sending people home that there's not a spike in domestic violence. Mm-hmm. And then mental health. And the mental health one, we're, we're the only department with a mental health strategy over the 23 bits of Queen's and Goodman. Others will catch up. but So you've got to be careful as well, which is the resilience side again. That if you put your people in a situation where they're working from home, one is you'll always get people that will game it, but that's a, that's a minority. Forget that. The other people are using it for um, stress relief, uh, they're using it for looking after kids that they have to. But our problem is now is that today, the three of us, we've got a start point and we've got an end point, and that's our working day. You're working from one, you've got a start point. It's not necessarily an end point. So we got enormous increases in productivity that we measured. Sickness came down as well because people didn't have to you know, go on a sick look after a child and just you know, work from one. You've got to be really cautious that there's no unintended cons- consequences like, um, you know, you've got mental health issues or you've got domestic violence issues. And I remember when British Telecom um, was formed and I think it was 200,000 of them in the UK and they sent them all home. And they lost 40 to 50% of the staff because people were disconnected from the team. So we do a lot of teamwork as well and make sure there's a lot of check-ins and you can't, work from one Monday or Friday normally because then people just make, you know, long weekends. Or if like a director general like me, you know, we don't like working Wednesdays because it breaks in to both weekends. So that was a joke. <laughs> but there you go. But no, I think I think the stuff that um, Peter Clough did, he actually he wrapped a lot of rigour around, you know, the concept of hardiness, but it's also a trait. So fortunately, yeah. you know, I've had this trait for a long time. I've cultivated it, and then now I'm trying to push it out uh, to, to the staff. And it, I think it is working because I think our response to COVID-19 was was exceptional. And, you know, we never closed a single site down. Uh, the working from home, I think, is now embedded. I think we're getting really good benefits out of it. We're here, we've got 25 and a half million people on either the biggest island or the smallest continent in the world. So we've got a different, different range of problems altogether. But mental toughness, I think, particularly here in transport, has stood us in good stead because um, everybody's an expert in transport because they've been on a bus <laughs> once, driven a car once, or so, yeah. you know, flew somewhere. So it must be easy. That's, that's brilliant, Neil. That's, that's fantastic. What you've done in the last, uh, actually, about 20 minutes... You've taken a mental toughness concept, you've wandered around team building and leadership, and you've shown how they all connect. You spoke a a lot about resilience, but as you know, there's another side to mental toughness, and that's what we call positivity. And in fact, in a sense, you were a trigger for what we've now done with the mental toughness concept, because we've been able to grow it, especially our understanding of challenge. And challenge consists of two elements and you've already spoken about one of those aspects and that's uh, learning orientation the importance of learning from everything that happens to you and having a continuous learning ethos but the other side was is about risk orientation and that I think is one of your hallmarks because risk orientation is essentially about seeing opportunity and seizing it where other people will see threats so when you see the COVID crisis, we saw lots of people just sort of collapse. They, they didn't want to look up. You looked up and you, 
he saw the opportunity for bringing in systems and uh, processes that would keep people secure.